Good morning and welcome to Worship Grace. Welcome to this time when we gather together, when we pause in our weekly scuffle and we take some time to fill our hearts, to praise God and to be in community, even in this continuing unique online way. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. Welcome to this pause in our weekly journey. And welcome also to our Forward in Grace Sunday, when we talk intentionally a little bit about the ways that we can commit to the ongoing work of Grace Lutheran Church. You should have received in your mail, in your snail mail inboxes, a letter from us here at GLC, along with one of these green uh, commitment cards. Our hope is that you'll be able to fill this out and return it to the church so that we might know what all you're willing to commit to grace in this coming year. And I would also say there's space on here for your monetary commitments, but there's also space on here, even on the back, to scribble some ideas about commitments that you would like to make in terms of emotional commitments, time commitments, community commitments, all of that wrapped up is the entirety of what we are trying, the entirety of our commitments towards what we are trying to do here at Grace. Our gifts, our talents, our time, all of that is how we are able to continue to be God's people in God's world together. So please, if you have not yet filled one of these out, uh, if you're coming into worship anytime soon, you're certainly welcome to drop them in the, in the offering plates. You can drop them at the front office. You could mail them back to us in an envelope, whatever works best for you. You could even email the front office and just let us know. But we would love to know how we are all growing together, how we are all moving forward in grace together. So please do return those. As your earliest, at your earliest convenience. There it is. Well, with that, let us turn to prayer. Let us turn to a time when we open our hearts and listen to the presence of God as it surrounds us, fills us, informs us, guides us, and fills our entire beings. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for your presence amongst us. Be with us during this time of worship as you are with us every moment of our lives. Help us today and always to remember to choose joy, to choose laughter, to commit ourselves to your spirit of goodness, your spirit of joy, your spirit of laughter. For we know that it is within this spirit, within this laughter, that we are to find true and lasting life in you. Help us when we are lost in despair to instead feel your presence, your giddiness, your joyfulness. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now church, together we sing.
joyful, joyful indeed. Well, church, together we now turn to our gospel reading, which today comes to us from the 21st chapter of the gospel according to Luke, the 5th through 19th verses. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
as for these things that you see, the days will come when not stone will be left upon stone. All will be thrown down. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers. By relatives, you will be betrayed. You will be hated by all because of my name. Yikes. <laughs> this, is, this is hardly a go, a happy-go-lucky, laughter-filled Jesus that we see and we are met with here in Luke 21. This is a gloomy Jesus, a Jesus who is being very real about the world around him, a Jesus who is being very real with his listeners. Now, I know when we read this, because I also just said it, it's very tempting and understandable to look at Jesus as a bit of a gloomy Gus, <laughs> to look at him as someone who is really turning to some of the heavier stuff in life rather than just celebrating what's in front of him. And there's a very good reason he does this. He does this because he knows his audience. He knows who he's talking to. And he's not he's not only talking to us. I mean, we're hearing his words now, but at the time he was talking in a very specific context to very specific people. He is gathered outside the second temple of Jerusalem, gathered around those who would have grown up hearing stories of the destruction of the first temple. He is standing with those who are so excited that the temple still stands, that it's as beautiful as it is. They are admiring the walls and admiring the gifts that people have brought. And he says, it's not meant to last. Perhaps he's recalling, which many of those gathered there would know, the story of Ezra, or the story told in Ezra, rather, in Ezra 3, of the laying of the foundation of this temple. This is recalled in Ezra 3, verses 11 through 13. All the people boomed out hurrahs, praising God as the foundation of the temple of God was laid. As many were noisily shouting with joy, men of the, many of the older priests, Levites, and family heads who had seen the first temple. So this is the laying of the foundation of the second temple. When they saw the foundations of this second temple laid, wept loudly for joy. People couldn't distinguish the shouting from the weeping. The sound of their voices reverberated for miles around. People couldn't tell the difference between the weeping and the shouting for joy. This is the context in which Jesus is talking. This is the story that he knows will have been told to those who are listening. That this temple once destroyed already and then resurrected, this temple holds an important place in the community and the culture of his listeners. And they also carry with them the trauma and the hurt, the pain, the heaviness of the destruction of the first holy place, the first temple. Now into this context, it might seem odd, uh, a little bit dissonant, perhaps, to bring into our, or bring in our guidepost for today, our guidepost from our fall series. Now, our guidepost today feels out of sorts at the moment with our text. And that's because our guidepost is that those who live wholeheartedly, those who live with a whole full heart, cultivate laughter, song, and dance, and let go of being cool or always in control. The idea of laughter in the face of the destruction of the first and second temple of Jerusalem hardly seems appropriate, hardly seems where Jesus would point us to. There's so much more in our reading about all the ways in which living a Christ-centered life li means living counter to the world around us. And but I think somewhere in the midst of this Jesus message and this context from which he's speaking is this bridge between the context, the pain, the heaviness, 
and the unending joy that is a part of it as well. After all, at the very foundation, at the very forming of this temple, we hear from Ezra, the prophet, that there was great shouts of joy at the same time that there was deep wailing. So if we look to joy, if we look to laughter, we can sometimes feel like that silliness, that laughter, that letting go of stoicism might feel like a betrayal, a inappropriateness when it comes to the seriousness of faith. When in reality, laughter and joy is the very bedrock of our faith and our life found in Christ. There's a great poem that the um, mystic, the scholar, the teacher, the Eastern wisdom Hafiz has written. Uh, this is a collection of his poetry. And in it, this, the whole collection is called I Heard God Laughing, which I just love. But this poem has been on my mind and on my heart this week. So I wanted to share it with you. This poem is called Laughter. What is laughter? What is laughter? It is God waking up. Oh, it is God waking up. It is the sun poking its sweet head out from behind a cloud you have been carrying too long, veiling your eyes and heart. It is light breaking ground for a great structure that is your real body called truth. It is happiness applauding itself and then taking flight to embrace everyone and everything in this world. Laughter is the pole star held in the sky by our beloved, who eternally says, yes, dear ones, come this way. Come this way toward me in love. Come with your tender mouths moving and your beautiful tongues conducting songs, and with your movements, your magic movements of hands and feet and glands and cells dancing. Know that to God's eye, all movement is a wondrous language, and music such exquisite wild music. Oh, what is laughter, Hafiz? What is this precious love and laughter budding in our hearts? It is the glorious sound of a soul waking up. The glorious sound of a soul waking up. Oh, I just got straight to my heart. Every time I read it, it is the, it is the sound of a soul waking up. Laughter is the bedrock of everything that we do. It is the source of all our resilience. It is the source of our very being. Willie James Jennings, are a, an incredible scholar and theologian, speaks to this when he says that joy is an antidote to pain. He says, I look at joy as an act of resistance against despair and its forces. Joy as an act of resistance against despair and its forces. If we are lost in despair, how are we to feel God's presence? If we are lost in despair, how are we to see the presence of God in one another? Despair is one of the greatest, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? One of the greatest divisive forces in our world because it tells us that we are alone that there is no hope, that there is no purpose, there is no point, so why try? There is nothing outside of this, so why bother? That's despair. And laughter is the gr single greatest antidote to that despair. Makes me think of, um, there's a spell in the Harry Potter universe to counteract a animal called a bogart. And a bogart takes on any, the greatest fear of the person it's currently facing. So if it came up to you, it would shape shift into your greatest fear, and then it would move on to the next person and shape shift into their greatest fear. And the only way to defeat this bogart is to cast a spell, and the spell, the enchantment, is just by simply saying, ridiculous. And as you cast this spell, you're supposed to imagine in your head the most ridiculous appearance for this fear of yours. 
because the single greatest defeater of a Bogart, the single greatest defeater of despair and fear is laughter. Making this thing, this animal, into a source of humor and laughter is the greatest way to defeat it. In the same way that laughter is the greatest way to overcome fear and worry in our own lives. The amazing, fantastic author Cole Arthur Riley in her book, This Here Flesh, Spirituality, Liberation, and the Stories that Makes Us, that Make Us, talks about joy in a whole chapter. She dedicates an entire chapter to the importance of joy as spiritual practice, as spiritual food for our journey. And she offers an important distinction. She distinguishes between joy and happiness. And they're both important. Happiness, though, she says, is momentary. It's part of our sympathetic nervous system, the same sympathetic nervous system that would tell us to fight, flight, freeze, or there's a fourth one. But the sympathetic nervous system that is involved in our quick movements and our momentary things that keep us alive, keep us safe, laughter and happiness do that. And joy, she says, is part of an unending depth of tranquility that happiness can't quite reach. It's part, it's worked out rather, in our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the nervous, the part of our nervous system that helps calm us down and return us to calmness, healing, ongoing life beyond the momentary spurt of movement. Neither of these is anything close to what you may have experienced in your life as toxic positivity. This is not the kind of happiness. This is not the kind of joy that pretends. This is the kind of emotion that lives deep within your bones and is experienced in community. Joy and happiness, but especially joy, is inherently communal. We see this throughout our scriptures. We see this throughout Psalms. There are moments in pretty much every Psalm in which the community expresses lament and sadness, as well as joy, gratefulness, and steadfastness found in God. Joy is inherently communal. Joy also holds space for ground and even grounds other emotions. So this is one of my favorite tests when it comes to joy, is if you think you found joy, one of the best ways to figure out if it's real is if you can be both joyful and carry sadness at the same time. If the joyful you're experiencing does not allow for space or does not encourage you to feel the sadness, the heaviness of the world that you bring with you, it's not true joy. Joy is a space that is big enough and expansive enough to hold everything, to hold our sadness, our heaviness, our anger. I think so often we think that if you're feeling one, you can't feel the other. If you're feeling angry at the world, you can't possibly feel joy. If you're feeling horribly, horribly depressed at the state of the world, you can't possibly feel joy. And the exact opposite is actually true. Think about the number of times that you've either experienced or heard others say that you can't imagine, you can't understand why those who have seemingly so little have seemingly so much joy. We hear this every time someone goes to visit with our recently, um, not recently arrived, but a new to us Afghan refugee family that we are walking with and accompanying with now. Every time someone goes to visit their house, all that many of us think entering into their space is all that they have lost and all that we would be feeling that we might be feeling, because we can't fully understand, but all the things that we might be feeling when entering into their space and into their community. And every single time, every single person who has interacted with our family comes away saying, I feel fuller, I feel fed, literally and spiritually, I feel full because of what they had that they gave me. 
That is what joy is. It is healing. It is life-giving. And it is often felt most keenly in the face of great pain, great separation, great hurt and heaviness. Not because those things need to be separate, but because joy is how we survive those things. Joy is how we cultivate wholeheartedness. Now, to tie this all together into our current state, or not our current state, our current Sunday, since we are in our Forward in Grace Sunday today, this joy is what we are committing to every time we fill out one of these green cards. It's almost like this green card is a vote for the kind of church, the kind of joy you want to live in. It is a way of choosing and a way of spreading joy. Because commitment to joy is commitment to building a Christ-like community. Every time each one of us chooses joy, We are choosing life. We are choosing Christ. We are choosing community. Every single time. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to get at in this passage, in our gospel reading for today. Gospel-centered life is not always about happiness. It's not always about what I want. It isn't always about safety. It isn't always about comfort. It isn't always about happiness. But it is always about joy. It may mean that we face the destruction of our holy places. It may mean that we participate in the destruction of others' holy places. It does not mean that we get it right all the time. It does mean that we beg for forgiveness It does not mean that we have the answers. It does not mean that we are happy. But it does mean that our entire basis, our entire grounding is joyful. It does mean that we continuously are waking up to the presence and joy of Christ around us. So church, how are you waking up? How are you leaning into joy and laughter? How are you committing to seeking out song and dance and joyful movement in your life? Not because joy is a luxury, but because joy is a necessity. The ground on which we build our lives. Joy is the blessing on which we stand. Our wellspring of good and goodness and hope. This week and always, may you be find that well. May you drink deeply of this well. And in this deep drinking, in this quenching of your thirst, in this momentary presence that is ongoing and never ending, may you be so transformed that the world around you is transformed too. Transformed by the goodness you have found at this well transformed by laughter. Amen. says to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of hair Just one touch My eyes are open to see And I believe There's nothing better God can do There's nothing
Together, we turn to prayer yet again, a time when we might hear God's laughter in our very spirits. Let us pray. Holy One, we ask that you bless us this day and every day with wrinkles around eyes, around scrunched noses. Bless the very earth on which we stand, the very air that we breathe with laughter, with the sound of giddiness and hopefulness. Be with us when our hearts harden or our despair gets the best of us. Replace our despair with your laughter. Teach us this day and always to turn to you, not to self-isolate when we have found ourselves in the depths of despair, but instead to turn to you, to your people to your laughter and your goodness. All of this we pray in your holy name, trusting in you and trusting in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear ones, we pray together using the words of our Lord's Prayer, as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Dear ones, receive this blessing. Every morning that you wake, may you feel the peace that can calm the fiercest storm. May you feel the love to forgive and then move. May you feel the strength to walk and not grow weary. May you feel the joy that is at the heart of being. May you feel the presence of God in the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Now go in peace, dear church. Christ goes with you. Thanks be to God.